Who's Parsec running? Is a, um, it's just a, an award for um, uh, speculative fiction podcasts. Oh, but everybody, there's there's novels and short fiction and all that stuff too. Yep, there's novels, yeah. there's short fiction. There's um, I found out later, sorry, that there's uh, channels like yours, you know. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Just talking. I didn't author realize that at first. I thought it was what? all stories, but apparently not. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, I mean, it's just fascinating, man. Can you get into the guild now? How does that work? Are you in the guild? Science I don't know what fiction. you mean by guild science fiction i mean the people that are in where you're being nominated for they're all like uh there are certain publications and certain <laughs> organizations that you can get into that count as credit towards getting a mission into the science fiction writers guild which is very wow. on par with uh, like the writers guild in hollywood or something along those lines it's a guild that protects the members from being um treated badly you know that's why there's a set rate of like six cents a word or something along those lines for a lot of the publications because that's what that's like the minimum amount that qualifies them to get them up there but you don't even charge anything you don't pay anything it's it's, right. it's interesting that i mean because i i think that's one of those prestigious awards but then again i might be talking on my ass i didn't do any research I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll look into it now that i know about it right i need I to start looking it into it. i'm realizing as i'm talking i don't know what i'm talking about so I don't know. I thought I saw some pretty interesting name like Clark's World or With You and things like that, right? I I I think Clark's World was no. I'm thinking of um Who's uh, Cast of Dreams. With there was Cast of Dreams. I can pull it up. I've actually got it saved right over here. Where did it go? Um I seem to have lost my link. Where did I put it? <laughs> of course, because you need it right now. Uh, there it is. 2018 nominees. Who's the novel? Oh. If you can see it. What's that? Who's the novel? The guy, the people that are not, isn't Scalzi nominated on that, on that list? I mean, I know I had it up too. Why am I asking this? I have computers. I have, I have the internet. <laughs> 2018 Parsec Awards. Not that this is what our podcast is going to be about. Obviously, we're going to be talking about Robert Aspen. Yeah. Um, just curious. That was just something on my mind. Uh, there we go. I'm going up against uh, Cast of Wonders, Seminar, uh, Escape Pod, LeVar Burton Reads, which, you know, he well, was the reading Rainbow Guy and also Jordy LaForge, obviously. Yeah. Uh, oh, he didn't get his in. Oh, so I guess I'm not going up against him or Cast of Wonders because they didn't get their stuff in in time. Oh, interesting. So you what? Did you win? There's only one other person against you? Well, no. There's also uh, Root Alchemy, uh, Toasted Cake, Smirk, Uncanny Magazine Podcast. Uncanny. There you go. That's the uh, name that just qualified you on a level that I couldn't I can't even believe you're qualified on. <laughs> Unca Uncanny is one of those. They are actually a qualifying magazine for the SF. Yeah. They, they've won this thing many times, time. apparently. They've got it like several years oh, in a row. They've got a really good production. They actually have like a podcast set up in a way where they tell you the story eventually, but they actually tell you the story of the story and then the story of the publication that the story is in. And they're geared towards people with special like special needs, handicapped individuals and stuff like that, I think. Oh, I didn't know that. I think they suffer from muscular dystrophy. A family member, a loved one, a child, something like that. There's like a horrible thing happening in their family they have to oh. deal with. Yeah, it's pretty tough. I mean, it's not like, you know, you're obviously people appreciate what you're having to go through as well, which I, you know, I see people comment on, but my story got a comment like that. I was like, wow. <laughs> nice. Do you get that a lot where people are kind of reaching out about what brought you to the audiobooks? Um, Occasionally. I mean, I mean, I had that one interview with io9 a long time ago, and that definitely was all about that. But I'll occasionally have somebody ask about that in like a, a personal email or, you know, on Twitter or something like that, but not too often. I mean, reading Most for the blind, the right? I mean, basically, that's what we're talking about. That's where you came from. You're yeah. being read to because you were blind. When yeah. I was going through college, I, I did some volunteering work at WUSF reading magazines and stuff that went out over the radio um to be read to the blind or whatever that's it's hardcore yeah it's interesting stuff yeah absolutely and i mean robert aspirin is what brought you here actually huh 
Yes, tonight is about Robert Asprin. <laughs> the whole reason that you're you're doing what you're doing is Robert Asprin. Let me yes. just do, let me just throw out a quick introduction so okay. I can tack it on to the beginning or whatever where this is going to end up. Um, let's see. So, welcome to Mirage. Uh, this is Brian Aiello, and today Chris Heron is joining me, and we're going to be speculating on Robert Asprin. And basically, we just had a little bit of conversation about where you're doing in terms of the Parsec Awards. And I knew nothing about it, and turns out you're pretty prestigious, dude. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. Uh, just nice hanging out. Yeah, yeah that's good cool. to be so here again. Who, who's Robert Asprin to you? So Robert Asprin is one of those guys uh, that I read back when I was younger. Uh, you know, same time period as uh, when I the last podcast that we did together, where I was talking about uh, Pierce Anthony. Uh -huh. But I've continued to read him. Uh, all the time you know i still read him Do because you okay. he's, yeah he's his, 2008 so he's not putting on any new stuff unless i i do believe that somebody took over the uh the book series i've only read the first 10 or 11 something oh, like that so he's got somebody writing his book series under a different name yeah the myth so adventures his, book oh, series uh the about the last half of them um, he had gone through a period, and this is why I've only read half, is about halfway through, he stopped writing for seven years. Yeah. Something to do with taxes, right? I mean, he had legal problems. Oh, was it? I, I don't like, know. Yeah. He had I conversations just... with the IRS who were basically telling him, you should probably write so you could pay us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought he was just, I, I didn't know if he had passed away or if he was just done writing the series or what, but nothing came out for several years, so I just stopped looking and it wasn't until recently that i realized he came back eventually that's what's fascinating about this guy right because he did die very young in 2008 which would put him what at 57 years old something along those yeah. lines right i mean a lot so, older than that but yeah he wasn't and, that I mean, old. there's some pictures of him on wikipedia his shirts you know unbuttoned down to his you know solar <laughs> plexus or whatever so, I mean, this is an interesting oh, yeah. guy <laughs> going in <laughs> you see it <laughs> yep, I know what you're talking about i've seen that picture it's a uh -oh. it's, so I mean that's my impression. He died young and he looked crazy. What are the novels? I mean, what are we talking about here? They said fi fantasy and science fiction is what he writes. But yeah. let's break down the science fiction. What kind of science fiction is it? Um, so I've only read his Myth Adventure series, which okay. is that's the science fiction one. Well, it's primarily oh, fantasy. Okay, let's talk about the fantasy one. It, what kind of I fantasy? guess you could call I guess you could call it a um a sci fantasy because there's oh, science okay. fiction rolled into it. But it's it's mostly a fantasy. If you had to boil it down to one or the other, it's like eighty percent fantasy. Is the other series the same? Do you know, or is it you're just completely have no clue? I have no clue about his other series. Oh, okay. um, I honestly didn't even know he had some until recently. Science fiction <laughs> fantasy. I mean, obviously, Star Wars comes to mind immediately. But then again, yeah. Star Trek is considered science fantasy as well. Anytime you put like mythical technology behind something that you know, what do they call it, Phil Bottom. What's that term, dude? It's like a a thing, fake technology thing. Right. Oh, yeah, it's a um, thousand times. Philobodium or something like that. I can't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just a made up word that means something. I only talk Special for a living. You can't expect me to know words. <laughs> uh huh. Here it is. It's an impossible or imaginary device which is used to move forward the plot of a TV show, book, or film, especially in science fiction and fantasy. And you know what I'm going to do? Since you're the smart guy who likes to talk things out Are you loud. About my no, it's totally something different. I'll send oh, you okay. the, the link to the page that I'm on right now. This is, I mean, basically, let's say you want to operate your warp drive, right? Back okay. in the original series, they needed the lithium crystals, right? And the, that would be the equivalent of what I'm talking about. Gotcha. And, I mean, you say philobotium. I'll let you pronounce it. Where the hell is Hangouts? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I'm getting into the habit again of not starting a, uh, a timer. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sent you a link in uh, Hangouts if you could see it. Okay. Yep, I saw that. And that is talking about... Because, I mean, he is considered fantasy, right? He's science fiction and fantasy on his Wikipedia page. And you're saying science fiction fantasy is mixed within this particular series. 
And I just sent right. you the link so you could thing. see like what that term is in terms of can we classify his work as just completely fantasy or is the science fiction actually working on principles that I don't know, like Isaac Newton or Einstein or like Phil uh, Stephen Hawkins wrote math about or whatever. In this series here? Yeah, the one that we're talking a myth. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little bit lost. <laughs> um, Sorry. Uh, so it's 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 only got science fiction in so much that uh, it's multiple dimensions. Mm. So uh, the premise in in a nutshell is basically you start out with this character and he's uh, in a backwoods kind of world where you know magic is a thing, but it's not much of a thing. It's kind of medieval period and stuff like that. Okay. And he wants to be a thief. Well, he's starving and he comes across a uh, uh, a magician in his hut tries to steal from the magician ends up becoming his apprentice and then um basically what happens is he's getting an argument with his master at some point and the master's like fine i'll show you some real magic and he starts doing all this fair and all this you know uh putting candles in a pentagram and boiling cauldrons and whatnot and then an assassin shows up and kills the guy right in the middle of summoning a demon demon pops out scares the crap out of the kid and then starts talking you know kind of like almost uh a New York gangster from you know the the old movies or whatever, yeah. and it's kind of like what the heck is going on? Turns out that there's all these different worlds, and they were just kind of pulling a prank on this kid because he doesn't know anything. Well, uh, the master and this demon whose name is Oz were always pranking each other at the same time that they would always summon each other to kind of impress the newbies. Yeah, and so Oz is left without his powers and has to train the kid to get back home. And so that way, Skeeb, the kid, becomes Oz's apprentice. And they go through this whole thing and eventually end up on these other worlds, some of which have high technology, some don't. You know, so it's just this whole kind of hodgepodge of whatever he wants to do, he can. Like, I obviously don't read anything at all. Being being whatever subject's on this podcast, I have never touched it um, with my reading abilities. But, I mean, it almost sounds like Wizard of Oz, right? I mean, it does sound like he's going to try to hide it. Oh, they do. He's, he's like, no relation. It's like, what do you mean, no relation? No relation. You know? There's a lot of pop culture references, you know, going okay. all over the place. A lot of puns. Well, not a lot of puns. Not like Pierce Anthony level puns. But there's the occasional pun. So interesting. You know? So I mean, this is kind of like that third author that we've talked about that kind of does that thing, huh? Because he wrote a lot of books as well in, the, in these worlds. These 200 page, like real quick reads. He's putting them out every other year, right? Or every year, or every six months. I don't remember how long apart they were. It seemed to be like every year, I think. Um, but but yeah, this was your have... stuff. Though. This is what you like growing up. <laughs> you like yeah, that. Yeah, this is what yeah. I love growing up. And one thing I love about the books, and one reason I still read them, is they're so short, they take about three hours to read at a regular reading pace. So if I'm going to the doctor's office, I'll take one of these. If I'm you know, sick in bed, I'll read four of these while I'm sick. You know, So that's, I've gotten through the first five books of the series probably about eight times. <laughs> Interesting. But yeah. so, I mean, what what's so compelling about it for you? Is it just a warm, comfortable bath, like a remembrance of your youth, or That's is it definitely... actually like really, really good writing that I am missing out the pipe, not be able to dive into it? Will I? But I mean, definitely a bit of really both. Okay. Uh, I mean, one thing is you can after you've read it, you can definitely turn your brain off while you're reading it, so it's not something that you have to pay close attention to. You don't feel bad if you put the book down because it's not. I have to get back to the story kind of book, but the guy is really good at having a solid uh, plot structure. You know, he has all the points that you need to hit to, to make it fun the entire way through. Even if you've read it before, you know, it's coming, but it's still satisfying when you get there. And the characters are really well fleshed out. And a lot of the um, dynamics or not dynamics, a lot of the, uh, I guess, gimmicks with the magic and stuff like that and the different locations, it's really creative you know it's he's got some really great imagery in there as well so it's 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 solid it's really solid but it's not you know the highest quality that you'll ever find or anything like that it's just really good well he made the new york times bestseller list so i mean other people must have yeah. agreed with you oh definitely um, it's a very popular series from what i understand his bibliography is so extensive that wikipedia can't do anything more than a partial Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's what it says, partial <laughs> bibliography, which is very frustrating, right? Because then you wonder, what's missing? Yeah. Or maybe it's, yeah, Myth Adventures will be talking about 20 novels, maybe, give or take. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little over 20, to my understanding. And two of them have been published posthumously, right? 2008, he had published. Uh, yeah, uh, I do believe somebody else took it over. So maybe that's only 20 some of that he wrote in. And I know that a lot of them he co-wrote. A lot of his writing is actually okay. co-writing. Jody Lynn Nye is who he co-wrote yes. with. Yeah. That's interesting. And she just pops up in 2003. I believe the they did Thieves World together, or maybe it wasn't her. He did Thieves World with somebody, and I haven't read that, but that's one that I did want to pick up. I just kept forgetting to get around to it. But you've reread every single one of these books a million times, but you never moved on from them to the other series. Well, I, I've read the the first ten, <laughs> of which the first five I've read the most, because about that time is when I get back to real life and then set them down for another couple of months. Oh, I see. But, I, I I didn't know about the the ones that came after his uh, hiatus, so I actually haven't read those. So I do need to go and get those and put those in my collection so I can get around to them. When did we but, decide that he took a sabbatical? Was it 1990? Or... I think it was. No, 1993. 1993. Yeah, I he see was it. In now. The early 90s, either way. And he came back in 2001 with a chronologically set between. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a whole sentence with the title. Myth Ion Improbable 2001 chronologically set between myth directions and hit or myth. Yeah. So yeah, you didn't read it, so it didn't matter. So you read the first 10 up to 1993, potentially. Yeah. And then beyond that, you didn't read any of them. Oh, interesting covers. Yeah, and there's a bunch of different covers that have been done over the years. So I've got I like, like this. Oh, it's very interpolations of the first book. <laughs> what do you think sold you on this? What do you the the covers? When you look at this, is this a compelling story based on I don't know, can you look at another fine myth on Wikipedia and pull up the cover? I've if you got can, it right beside me. Okay, cool. So it has that what the hell is that? Is it a species, a dragon species? I mean this is my interpretation uh, of it, right? I mean you have like a pretty a, girl. Guy with there's a pretty girl, and she's scantily clad. Like, yeah, that's uh, the Tanda. Tanda. Her name is Tanda or Tananda, Tanda for short. And she's a trollop, which means she's actually a troll. She's a female troll, and the male trolls look like trolls. So they so usually a go male troll world. next to her. <laughs> that's a male troll. The no. Green thing. Oh, really? no, the green thing is Oz. And he's uh, he's from the world of perv, which perv. everybody calls ah. him a pervert, you know. It's like, is I'm not a pervert, I'm a perv. He's deliberately going for that perv thing? Yeah, yep. it's it's constantly coming up because it's kind of a, a trigger for him. Where like Skeev, the, the human there, uh, his he's from Claw. And so he's a clod. You know, they're not all puns like that, but there's no. that's where a lot of the puns come in is little things like that. Whereas Pierce wearing... Anthony, the entire world was puns. You know, yeah. everything was a pun. Well, that dude's wearing a Speedo, though. I mean... Yeah, I, I, he wasn't in the story. <laughs> oh, he wasn't in the story. That wasn't a part of no. it. Like, hey, my speedo. No, he, he's, he's actually got a high sense of fashion. So, <laughs> but he's wearing a speedo on the cover. Yeah, That's they wanted to get across the scaly nature. And then the, horrible, the dragon is right. Like, I mean, God, that's horrible. That's bad. This guy was successful. This guy took a break because he wasn't making enough money. That's what his Wikipedia said. He was oh, broke okay. in 1993 and couldn't make wow. money. He had two books on the New York Times bestseller list, and he was broke. Like he was not being able to make enough money to to make a, to earn, you know, to make a living, which is interesting mm -hmm. because he died at 59 from heart attack. So, do you think he had other issues? <laughs> I, I mean, it's kind of sounding like maybe he had some drug problem at one point or another, right? Could be. I mean, you're kind of a cellulose. I have an, not making I have money. an uncle who uh, did a lot of acid, looked a lot like his older pictures. <laughs> so. But acid, yeah, man, I guess you could do that. <laughs> but it's not really necessarily going to make you lose your career at 93. I, I'm not saying know. that he did acid or anything like that. I'm, I'm just saying he looks like my uncle who is doing acid. Yeah. Uh, I like the. I mean, it's interesting. It's too bad that it's not what the story is about, right? So this. Wouldn't be disappointing. Maybe stories were like that. God, I can't remember picking a book with a cover. I've been on Kindle for so long. Yeah, it's. I I usually pick books by cover. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just kind of always been my kind of method. But so, how did you get into Robert Aspirin? Did you discover him, or was he discovered for you? I can't remember. That was oh, yeah. when I was in elementary school. Oh, seriously, so, that long ago? Yeah, that long ago. 
So I, I mean, remember. does he flavor? How does he flavor your writing? How does oh, he flavor um, your enjoyment of? Yeah, uh, his sense of humor feels not quite as heavy-handed as like British humor, like Terry Pratchett, but it's it's really well uh, developed, and they are humorous books. The books are comedies. And so, I mean, I only write comedy for the most part. I very rarely step outside of that. And he was kind of my early introductions between him and a little bit of Pierce Anthony, who wasn't as much comedy. You know, these, those were my two introductions to fantasy and comedy. But So that's where I tend to write. Him, it's interesting. I wanted, to, I wanted to see where he grew up. And it looks like Michigan. And he died in New Orleans, which kind of fits that whole maybe drug thing, right? I mean, maybe. maybe. I don't know. I don't know. 2008, man. That was like. Well, I know he was a LARPer, so maybe he got skewered. I'm not sure. When did New Orleans happen? When did the dikes break? It was it 2008-ish? Wasn't it around that same time frame? Could be. I, I do remember hearing that he died the day that you know he died, and it was not around any natural disaster. At least that I can no, remember. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it. I mean, not like he died specifically because of results of that. I'm saying that maybe it should just suck then, and no, it was it harder be. to live or something. I don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? Depression. I mean, God, New Orleans is still kind of recovering. I thought for sure the whole city was going to be done. I told my mom when it happened. I just happened to be there when you know that it went bad. It's like, dude, we just saw the loss of an American city. No more New Orleans. Yep. It's unfortunate. I mean, I thought we lost downtown New York during our hurricane situation. Yeah. It, it was disgusting. We drove through it. We, Brooklyn got it worse, but man, oh, really? climate change, dude. Yeah, it was really, really bad. A lot of historic places got destroyed, like Ugh. never to open again. There's this really great pizza place right off Coney Island that thankfully is still open. It's one of the best in the city, <laughs> but it's still different. You know what I mean? Everything is not the same. Yeah, Elkins really play a big part in that kind of stuff. And like Coney Island's gun. I mean, if you've ever been, have you been to New York? No, never been out that far. It's totally different. I mean, just they had to rebuild everything, I think. Yeah. Geez. Everything got washed away. So, I mean, New Orleans during that time, I don't know, right? But he died <clears throat> of a my myocardial infarction, which I, I imagine is oh, a yeah. Infarction. Yeah, and I, I think he actually had a... Um... I heard that he had a copy of one of Terry Pratchett's books in his hand. Yep. When they yeah. That, yep. That's interesting, right? Yeah. That's interesting. That's the way to go. <laughs> I guess, right? I mean, like he wasn't I upset. Do, doing something like that. Oh, my God. Can you imagine if he had a heart attack because he was laughing his ass off? <laughs> just enjoying the hell out of the writing or whatever. Just a big yeah. fan. He was a fan. I mean, that's another thing I, I gathered from his Wikipedia page yeah. is that he was a big fan of stuff. I don't know what it's a fan of necessarily. Unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't really tell you that. What does he say? Um, was an American science fiction and fantasy author and active fan. Thank you. I guess okay. he was an active fan of being science fiction and fantasy, right? That's I mean, cool. what else? I, <laughs> and his humorous myth adventures. And how do you say it? Is it Fuels Company? Oh, Fools? I think it's Fools. Fools. Okay. So it's an yep. F sound for the PH. I believe so. That's how I've heard it said. Well, that's but... his other series. That's the one that you did not bother to pick up. Yeah. So you're yeah, not I a true a... fan. You're not an active fan. I know. I, I need to be you're better. You're not an active fan. This is ridiculous. I, why do you pick subjects that you're not an active fan of? I want to know what active fan... <laughs> I want to know what active fan is. Am, am I an active fan of anything? Do you need to do anything to be an active fan? You know what I mean? Uh... What's a passive fan? Is that just something that you're aware of that you're not actually pursuing an interest in how are you an active fan i don't know wikipedia that really bothers me <laughs> i might have to go back to britannica aren't they going online now i think they are are they i, I didn't so. know they were still a thing they they are not becoming a thing um they're closing their print um business side of things i think i think they're going online though i think they're going to directly compete with wikipedia but i don't i don't know how you do that now <laughs> Right. They I mean, you're about 10, 15 years late for that. Like, you're going to make good decisions after the fact. Like, you've already got a shot in the head, and then you're going to duck. You know what I mean? That's just yeah. called falling dead. That's not doing anything really at that point. So, I don't know. What are they going to do, though? I mean, obviously, if they're still a business. They're not a nonprofit. They're going to have to charge money for people to check out their stuff. <laughs> Who in their right mind is going to pay them a subscription fee to view their 
encyclopedias. Yeah, I think this is the second time they've tried it, and the first time they did have a cost of some sort. And I can't see them doing it for free because they charge for their encyclopedias, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, they weren't free. <laughs> yeah, they were still around, so. I mean, I guess maybe you could have gotten them from some kind of mail order thing and never paid for them. They were <laughs> one of those ridiculous things, right? In the mailers. I don't know. We got them from door-to-door salesmen when I was a kid, but. Yeah, yeah that was a thing I remember, the encyclopedia or salesman. I never had one come to our house. We had a va- va- uh, vacuum salesman come. Yep, yeah, those two. Bought it. My we're dad so... bought one. Did you? Yeah. It was good vacuum cleaner, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Those are gone. Sales, door to door salesmen. <laughs> right? They're not coming to sell me encyclopedias or vacuum cleaners. And I still get I haven't, had, I haven't had a Harry Krishna person come in a long time either. What are they <laughs> called? <laughs> uh, Jehovah's Witness, you mean? Jehovah's Witness, yeah. I've not had one of those come and knock on my door. Or so more Harry Krishna matter. are in, uh, God, what the heck? Um, I don't think they're in America. I- as a big no, they are though because I've seen them here. I've seen them all oh, over the place okay. actually. Okay. Oh, they used to be on the Hasidic Jew Florida you? campus. What? You're not thinking Hasidic Jew, are you? No, absolutely not. Hasidic okay. Jews are very obvious, and we have those yeah. all over the place up here. But no, um, down in Florida on uh, uh, University of Florida campus, every day at like noon, there would be this group of uh, Harry Krishna people. They'd wear the orange Ooh. gowns and they'd have the shaved scalps and they have little braids. They'd give a, a free vegetarian lunch that absolutely gave me the shits one day, and I never tried it again. But <laughs> I, it was still an experience I have. I mean, they gave you, they That's tried cool. to give you literature, and it was so horrible, dude. <laughs> I mean, I'm a McDonald's guy. I can't stand stuff like that. <laughs> Much As of a sustenance? Shock, yeah, man, it was not good. I don't even remember what it was. I didn't eat it. It looked very scary. And there were no <laughs> utensils, or I don't know. I'm not going to be. <laughs> Jehovah's Witness. The whole thing is very bizarre. Why are we talking about that again? I have uh, no idea. Google's company is not Harry Krishna, is it? Or <laughs> Jehovah's Witness? I don't think so. <laughs> aren't they aren't they interchangeable the terms Harry Krishna and and Jehovah's Witness or are they not? Oh, are they? Is one of them derogatory? Am I making fun of them with the Harry Krishna term or something? If we are, it's not intentional. Yeah, right. I have no clue. It's <laughs> ignorance completely. I don't think that's an excuse anymore though. I, I thought they were completely to... different. Yeah, but... I, I don't know. Maybe they are. I'm not going to look up though, because for some know. reason we're some for some reason we're talking about it, and I don't know why. Yeah. Um, back to Robert. So <laughs> back to back to um, Robert Aspirin. He's got an interesting name. I wonder if he has so, any relation to the Aspirin family. I didn't know that was a family. I Other than you know, I mean, obviously there had to be because his name is Aspirin, but a prestige wonder, family. Yeah, prestige family. Uh, one of the things that I really like is, about his writing, though, is he's very good at putting a little twist at the end of everything. Okay. You know, it's it's kind of like um, with J.K. Rowling. You always get the ending, and it's like, oh, that was really, you know, satisfying. Or I didn't see that yeah. coming. He's pretty good at uh, laying the groundwork for things to kind of just come together like that. Not always, but a lot of the time. I mean, that's nice, right? I mean, that's what you aim yeah. for when you write as a payoff. To suck people into the next chapter and make them want to flip that page. I mean, there's nothing more irritating than being exhausted and knowing yeah. that time is slowly evaporating before you have to wake up the next morning. And that stupid author who wrote that book in your hands keeps laying out that last part of that <laughs> chapter in a way that makes you want to read more. You can't put it down. I love it so much. You yeah. know what I mean? That's what you aim for. And that's that's fantastic. I mean, what was the twist exactly? Can you put your finger on it and kind of define it or no? Oh, in different books? Yeah, or just generally. I mean, you say he puts a twist on things. I mean, was it um, kind of specific or was it just, just something general? Each okay, time? so like in the very first book, uh, like I said, these are sometimes minor, but they're still really satisfying. It's like, I see what you did there. In the first book, when Oz lost his powers and had to stick around to be this guy's apprentice, um, they found out eventually that it was because uh, the old master had used some joke powder yeah. that would take away your powers temporarily. And then you give them the antidote. And they're fine. Well, since he died, they couldn't find the antidote. He was stuck. They eventually go to the Bazaar at Diva, which is off-world. And it's this uh, marketplace that just extends off as far as you can see in all directions. And you can find anything there. And it's just kind of this giant spectacle. They eventually find a guy selling the same stuff, says there's nothing he can do for them, and they leave. Well, they get to the, uh, the final boss, you know, the guy who sent the assassin in the first place. 
and they're you know going to fight this guy and you're, they're ramping up for this big battle and then you know they kind of start talking and it's like well we already won it's like what do you mean well i put the stroke powder in your wine and now you have no powers and so it was it, it was a lot better than the way that i just described it but it kind of brought together these little um you know red herrings and uh you know things like that throughout the, the entire book and brought it all together at the ending and there was a climax but you know it was at mm -hmm. the end when everybody's about to die kind of thing but you said you we discovered this guy in elementary school too so are they middle grade fiction that he's writing or something more you could probably in middle school possibly middle school. even elementary elementary school so they're, they're young young reader books not necessarily no. uh, i i i do think that they're just written at an easy level i mean they say that if you can write uh cl as close to a second grade level as you can you'll have a wider base you know i i know that that sounds ridiculous but after second grade you you can read most stuff it's just some stuff will slow you down so if you're not using a lot of big words and you're using you know relatively easy sentence structure and stuff like that then you can you can keep along with this but it's by no means uh juvenile or anything like that it, but you could follow it as a kid there's nothing in there that is um uh like racist or uh derogatory or anything like that it's very interesting right i mean this is one of those authors that if you don't discover you don't know about possibly he doesn't yeah. he, he doesn't hang out very long he wrote a lot constantly writing every two years he puts out a novel 83 84 85 86 87 there's consecutive years every one a year 90 and then 93 then he took his gigantic break so he was never really prolific right i mean he wrote one occasional novel for what what's 78 and 93 15 years something like that he um, wrote 10 i guess i just know that when i was a kid uh, my candy store was the used bookstore and also the new bookstore uh, and they would always oh, have a decent section for robert aspirin so they he was on the bookshelves. He was on the bookshelves with 10 yeah. books. Uh, mostly was written, I think. Though. You were a kid I, in what? 2000? You were a kid in the early millennials. I was born in 83. 83. So yeah, I would have been uh, finding his books in the late 80s and early, early 90s. 90s. Okay. So he was still, yeah. those those books were the only ones that were available until 2001. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, he had a, a section on the, in fact, I think he still has a, a section in Barnes and Noble. I think I saw him the other day. And you're Colorado. Yeah, I'm in Colorado. So, I mean, it's not regional. I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with Colorado, so that can't be the reason. Um, I've never heard of him. Other people, have you talked to other people into science fiction and fantasy? Have mentioned him to you as being one of those dudes? Uh, my wife knew about him. Um, oh, uh, my what best friend said. knew about him. Uh, Ask my wife. Him. She didn't know anything about him. She had never oh. heard of him. <laughs> but she was yeah. like when did she read him uh when she was in like uh middle school and high school same time frame she's about your age as well yeah she's one year younger than me yeah so that's interesting so i mean i did not know about him but then again i was one of those dudes that didn't really aim for a specific author i just kind of read whatever was in in the in the library i like to uh get a bunch of stuff i never read anything by him unfortunately I um but there's not a lot here either. Like if you look at Wikipedia, it's very interesting that he went to college at the University of Michigan for a single year, right? Mm -hmm. And then he was in the military for a single year. Huh. And then he had two kids and I don't even know if he was married when he died because it doesn't say anything about who his wife was or his children, when you look at his little brief bio here. Um, I know the there's like is, almost no video of the guy. Oh, there's not. You looked. Okay, good. That's interesting. I wanted to hear him talk. There is. There's like one or two videos, but that's was like all you can find. Just a little bit of an, uh, an interview, like a marketing thing? Uh, no, one of them was he was uh, uh, talking about, I want to say, I can't remember if it was Dagger here or the SCA. I want to say the SCA, which is one of those LARPing groups where you go out and you pretend that you're, you know, fighting with axes and swords and stuff like that. He was a big part of that. Oh, and he then, was big in the LARPing. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, another one was uh, he was on a panel. Uh, I think it was 
no, it couldn't have been 2008. It had to be before that because 2008 was he died. But I think it was Dragon Con or one of those. But he was on a panel of some sort. And you saw his panel? Oh, no, the video. I'm sorry. The video. I was, reading, yeah. <laughs> I was just reading about his later work, wondering. I mean, he is kind of a mystery. There is not yeah. a lot here. I mean, Wikipedia is starting to really disappoint me. <laughs> Let's view the history. Maybe there's some legit stuff there that got deleted. I don't know, man. What do you think? He's going to end up being around for a while. You say he's still in Barnes & Noble. People are still reading him. You're recommending him to me. Do you think I should give him to my kids? Do you think I should sure. give him to my kids as an... I mean, time is the only finite thing, right? A novel takes yeah. a week. So you'd be taking a week's worth of time for one of my children from their life. You'd be murdering a week. Is it worth it? <laughs> I would say so. Especially if they read at a normal pace, it won't take a week. It'll take a night. A day, three hours. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's interesting. He died of a heart attack, and his last name is Aspirin. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> now who's doing the puns? Right? I mean, that's not good. <laughs> not good at all. What a legacy. I mean, you have to die. I mean, when you your last name is Aspirin, you really do have to have aspirations not to die of a heart attack. That's the one thing. I think you aim for because uh, it just becomes too ridiculous at that point, right? Or a stroke or something. You have to die of something else. You have to. Cancer is fine. I don't know. Oh. Poor guy, though, man. It doesn't say anything about his wife and kids. But I think obviously somebody must have gotten the rights after his death because they're selling the book still. He is still they're producing the rights for his myth world or whatever. Must you be know, owned um, by somebody. I, I know that I, I believe I read something a while back that his kids oh, shit. Uh, donated his rare book collection. Jody Lynn Nye so, is still writing these things. Oh, is that who's doing it? Yeah. That makes sense. She was co writing them. Yep. Yeah. So she's sole authoring them now. Gotcha. Yeah, most of his work, as far as I could tell, was co authored, or at least about half of it. We, yeah, it starts in when he came back in 2003. She was with him the entire time. It's interesting. I wonder where she is. If it's New Orleans, I'm going to say they are hooked up. <laughs> I think she was in Chicago, though, or New Orleans. Oh, she ran a rare books and special collections at the University Library in Nor uh, Northern Illinois. Oh, that's cool. So that's probably why she got the books. The Myth series is the only thing she's written. No, she's got a bunch of other stuff. I mean, honestly, at this stage of my life, I don't understand how these authors have this many books. How are they able to produce? I mean, this is ridiculous. Oh, short stories. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> she's crazy with the amount of work that she's produced, though. Oh, yeah? Yeah, she's really, really impressive. I'm going to have to check her out. She shouldn't be second fiddle to him. But I think, I mean, obviously... This is not in alphabetical order, but the mythology series is number one in her works. I mean, what does that mean? The the myth or myth adventure series or mythology series? She has a mythology series. Okay, that's got to be something different because these yeah, are the myth adventures. Different. It's uh, four books that came out in the nineties. Last one was two thousand one, and the myth adventures is get a few. I don't know, but you never read the other series, though. Yeah. And it's interesting because the only reason that you say science fiction is because of the dimensional aspects. But they don't yeah. really actually access the dimensional aspects without magic. Well, yeah. I mean, they, they've got like this thing called a D-hopper, which is just a little stick with dials on it. And you push the button and it, it lets you hop through dimensions. Oh, interesting. Um, some so of them can do the science. magic. That's well, the science aspect. That's a physical element that makes it do it. Or whatever there's the... that, but like the, the assassin that comes in in the first chapter, he kills the guy with a heat-seeking crossbow. Yeah. So it's like, you know, that's not supposed to be allowed on this world. It's against the rules because he's got, you know, future technology. But he'll yeah. travel to a place where he's like, you know, doing deals with the mob. And then he'll be going to a world that is all about crazy soccer fans. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think it ever goes high sci-fi. But there's definitely some, like, at least modern to slightly sci-fi elements to it. 
Do you think modern readers would tolerate this type of writing? Yeah. Or do they tolerate so. this type of writing? And if they do, who's writing like this nowadays? I think I asked you this before. Because, I mean, this is kind of a Pierce Anthony. This is a kind of... Um, Slightly dated? Is that what you're going well, for? Well, obviously, yeah, it's dated, right? Because the people who do this stuff are dead, <laughs> typically. Pierce Anthony is the only one that's still kind of alive. Hitchhiker's right. Guide to the <laughs> Galaxy is dead. I mean, the dude whose name I can't remember right now for some reason who did the turtle world books. Oh, uh, Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Perry Pratchett's dead. I mean, the only one that's still alive is Piers Anthony, right? He's still kicking it or did he die too? No, he, uh, well, as far as I know, last time we talked about a month and a half ago, he was still alive. Okay, I think that would make news. I, I would hope so. He's 83 years old though. So, I mean, time is ticking. Yeah. Who else is writing? Who else writes like this? I mean, maybe um, we mentioned Neil Gaiman last time too, but not really, right? Because Neil Gaiman is more he's not, not as world complex. like that. Yeah, I, oh, I complex will say, in the way of many volumes in the same world. No, Neil uh, Gaiman, his writing is just—I uh, mean, he's definitely a, a seat of the pants writer, and he has a lot of high concept stuff that he tends to block in together, and he's got a. a a style that I just find a little um, complex, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how to describe oh, really? it. Uh, th uh, where Robert Asprin, he's kind of by the book. It's like, you know, you know exactly where the, the plot is supposed to go and he ends up going there, but you don't know how he's going to get there or what it's going to do there. But it hits all those. It's like, this is act one. Here's the parts in act one. Here's act two. Here's the parts in act two. He, he does it by the, um, the formula that you're supposed to do it by. And his writing, it, it's, it would still hold up to modern standards. There's nothing wrong with it. There, there is a little bit of stuff where he makes some jokes that would not be acceptable nowadays oh, because, because of like of race you know, or sex and whatnot. Or... Yeah, it's it's mostly the the one that I can think of, the the trollop that you see on the cover there that was you know kind of uh, hot, I guess you would call her whatever you want to say. Uh, she is very flirtatious. I didn't think that, Chris. She's okay. a drawing, and I'm joking. Obviously, oh, yeah. she's she's made to appeal. Yeah, she's made to appeal to the guys. She's a trollop. I mean, that's part of the pun right there. Uh, but she uh, she's very flirtatious. All the guys are head over heels about her, you know, stuff like that. So there's that little bit of sexism. And then there was a character who is uh, extremely overweight, but she's in a world of overweight people, and she's overweight for them. So there's some uh, fat jokes towards her character but she ends up being one of the main characters and everybody loves her you know and they don't mind that she is this way she's just you know she probably weighs 600 pounds and wears le the leotards and stuff like that so it's there there's some jokes that are made that would not be allowed in society today but the writing itself would could be written by anybody today well, I would totally throw a 600 pound fat woman into one of my stories. I think that's a fantastic idea. I've played around with the idea of a gigantically obese, but I don't really care about social conventions either. Yeah. I mean, I think that's no, the... a, a great human to explore in a story and give them something, something to work with. You know what I mean? That's yeah, really there's nothing wrong with having a character like that. It's just the, the, the occasional joke, like mm. internalized joke that is made that you know would be considered oh well that's a faux pas in modern society i wonder though do the novels kind of do the smurf thing you know or the standalone 22 minutes where the cartoon is wrapped up neatly at the end yeah they're all kind of unique and individual and you're never going to say that one is the same as the other but at the same time the complexities aren't really there you know what i mean the, the, they're not going to resonate with you after you're finished you're going to digest them and move on to something else very quickly. You know what I mean? Or do these, do they have complexities that resonate more than a oh. Murph cartoon or something along those lines? Or is that even a fair question? I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by Smurf cartoon. But do you remember the Smurfs? I mean, like a cartoon in the eighties that was, I mean, they're bad now. Snorkels. <laughs> right. Something ridiculous. I mean, something that doesn't really have a lot of work going into it. So I think a lot of cartoons nowadays do. If you watch like Clone Wars or something along those lines, there's a progression of plot. There's a kind of what result. But cookie cutter. The ones in the 80s. I would say the Smurfs right. were kind of cookie cutter. Because I mean, yeah, you had Gargamel trying to, you know, did you watch the Smurfs as a 
occasionally. So I mean, when you have Gargamel <laughs> coming after yeah. the Smurfs, I mean, he catches or one. He there's not going to be any yeah. PTSD because that Smurf was caught. You know what I mean? There's right. not going to be a developing trauma because of the constant war they are at with this cat and man or whatever. But, okay. I, like, I, I think I get what you're asking. Um, so as the series progresses, um, there is no big worry about the characters. You're never like, oh, my God, is this guy going to die? You know, and it's definitely a lot like George R. R. Martin or George R. R. Martin, where he's killing off characters right and left. And scarring you ever them, right? I mean, you're taking of parts of them. I mean, you're ruining yeah, it's definitely the like novel, hard. and then making them deal with that in the, the following novel. I mean, is, is this is this what's happening? Is exactly. Working? No, th there's none of that. It's very lighthearted, but uh, he does a lot of stuff that definitely keeps you interested. Uh, like the the magic system, the guy only knows a handful of tricks, but the amount of ways that he figures out how to combine them, and the characters that he gets alongside oh, him and everything like that—that's that, fascinating. It really draws you through the books. So, I mean, what is that? That's a that's a um. Oh God, what's why is my brain not working tonight? What is <laughs> it? I mean, when you have something a deficit, you you're working against a deficit. How many spells or what can he do? Tell me about the magic that that he works. Okay. Um, so uh, the spells that he tends to have is, one, he can do a little bit of illusion on, like, faces. Eventually he learns that he can do it on most living things. So it's like he can make himself look like Oz, or he can make Oz look like himself, or, you know, anything like that. And they go into detail about how to do it. And it's very simplistic details to where you could imagine yourself doing it, which, by the way, I love it when authors do that, because you can, you can imagine how it's done and how it would feel you're way more likely to enjoy the book, in my opinion. You know, that's kind of what uh, uh, Rothfuss did. Um, and then... Uh, oh, so it's very true, uh, right? I mean, he had a very physical physical way of working with magic. And yeah. the limitations were physical, too, right? Because he could very, very badly hurt himself by messing up. Exactly. Or and he goes into the autonomy and all that it, stuff yeah. where it's like the, the mental exercises he has to do and the, the heart of stone. Good. Where, it's not yeah. just cut and dry. Yeah, I like that a lot, too. I like that a lot. Yeah, anytime oh. an author does that, I just eat that up. But So he's got like this, uh, the, the illusion spell. He can levitate objects, usually small objects, and he gets a little bit better. Uh, he learns how to light a candle, which later he can start to light wood on fire and stuff like that. And he can levitate and make wards. And that's about it. And with that, he like beats entire armies and you know all sorts of crazy stuff. I mean, it's it's fascinating because limitations are what make good conflict. Trying to figure yeah. out a way to use what you have. I mean, it's MacGyver, right? I mean, I don't know about the new show. Did it canceled the the new yeah. the re reformatting of MacGyver. But I mean, that's why we watch MacGyver, right? He would do things crazy with what was just available. And that's what we exactly. want with our adventurers when they don't have shit with them. The bag of holding yep. from D&D &D is kind of a, a <laughs> like a cheat, isn't it? Um, what's his yeah. face? Nicholas Ames. I think he just won an award for his novel, uh, The King of the Wild or whatever it was. He had a character with a bag of holding. He had <laughs> every single trope convention you could possibly have in a fantasy novel. and freaking love that book so much love it I've never got read sucked it. in oh man you got to pick it up king of the wild or kings of the wild kings it's of the really, wild really really good and he's got a like sequel coming time. out within the next few months or so called uh bloody rose or something like that so you're already you're almost two books behind catch up man catch up i will do <laughs> another so, thing that pulls you through is that the the characters are a little nefarious they are definitely not uh, too upstanding. I mean, they have morals. Oz definitely has no morals. He's all. That's what I'm saying, man. You got the guy in a freaking speedo on the cover. Put him in a speedo in the story. I want <laughs> to wear a speedo. I want to think of this scaly, you know, Italian-looking, greasy thing, just jiggling his way through the story, and you have to be forced to watch it. <laughs> it's not good. Not good at all. Um, but yeah, nefariousness. Everybody's kind of not good. They're well, not they're not not that they're not good. They're always wheeling and dealing. They're trying to talk you out of you know your sword and your knife and your money and everything like that. And they'll spin a yarn to kind of convince you that you need to give them this stuff because it's better for you in the long run. And then you walk off with nothing but a bag that you think is a magic rock, and you know something happens to you. You know, so that they're doing stuff like that all the time, and they're always making deals with 
uh, opposing sides and they're dealing with both sides at the same time, kind of halfway crossing everybody, but not quite enough to get in trouble. You know, and they eventually work for the mob and stuff like that. So it's it's a lot of fun because they're not the goody two shoes that you. Yeah, would that's interesting. Like that. What's coming to mind is like chaotic neutral, or not chaotic neutral, maybe even true neutral, or it's Firefly. You know what I mean? They go where the yeah. jobs are. They'll take yeah. the job for the money. It doesn't matter who's offering it, basically. Exactly. Yep. Even if somebody's already paid you to do the exact opposite thing. I mean, people don't like the goody two shoes. The yeah. the paladins or whatever they're kind of made fun of. You they're the the foil or whatever kind That's of ruin everybody's fun. Day. I mean, you can have a paladin as an anti-hero nowadays because you kind of want the the guy that's nefarious, don't you? That's going to wheel and deal. Yeah, that's not going to be telling the truth all the time. And a paladin will. I love the idea of a paladin, but this is not a paladin story. This isn't like an honorable group no. of people. No. Nope. The guy wanted to be a thief. <laughs> That's where you start out. Is he wants to be a thief? And I mean, you, I don't know if you could say that with Robert Asprin or not. That he wrote this series and that's all because he's got a bunch of work, right? Yeah, he's got a bunch of work. I just never read it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know anything about? I mean, how it was? I mean, he's obviously got a Wikipedia page that's very incomplete doesn't really have a, have a bunch of information. It doesn't break down the um, other novels. Though. I mean, it lets you know how many books are in the series anyway. But the dude wrote a lot. All oh, selected short stories is why the bibliography is shorter than it could be. I have a feeling that's how he made his living. Yeah, there's probably a bunch more there that is not showing up. Other novels. I mean, he wrote a bunch, man. He struggled for money. What else did he struggle with? Was it alcoholism? No idea. Was it cocaine addiction? I mean, what caused this guy to stop writing in 1993 or not pay his taxes? <laughs> he died of a heart attack. Maybe it was McDonald's. He was skinny. I mean, he was skinny fat. He does, he does look yeah, skinny fat, doesn't he? I don't know. There's a picture of him here. The one with his uh, blue shirt open to his belly button. Oh, dude. <laughs> he was... Not an attractive guy, was he? <laughs> Poor dude. And you could tell he wrote science fiction. <laughs> That's bad. That's bad. No, I don't know. It's not a great picture. That's for damn sure. But I mean, it looks like it came from the 70s, and nobody looked good in the 70s. I got some pictures of myself in the 70s that don't look good, and I was like a baby for most of it. I don't know, man. So okay. what, what is your what is your thinking going into the end of the podcast, thinking of Robert Asprin? Think people should read him for educational purposes, to be better writers? Is he going to offer anything in terms of philosophy or literary theory that'll, that'll help people become a, a better writer? Well, if you need to learn how to do a little bit of comedy because you suck at it, he's kind of a good guy to learn some basics from. He's really good at um, uh, imagery, like locations and stuff like that. And uh, his plot structure is just phenomenal. You know, he just pulls you straight through. You feel every single beat as it happens. So, yeah, if you read him, you might learn a couple things unless you've already got those under your belt. I mean, it's nothing much more than the basics and a little bit beyond. So it's not going to be this revolutionary thing that just, you know, oh, expands your mind in every direction. But if you're starting out, I think it would be a good way to get a handle of what a good story is, if that makes sense. But but they are body, though, right? I mean, they do have kind of the sexual thing happening with the, the trollop and... Oh, and very little. Very yeah, I mean, okay. you, you could read that in elementary, or not elementary, uh, like middle school, and just kind of smirk. You know, there's nothing, there's no sexual uh, happenings at all, just more uh, the main character is really attracted to her. And that's about it. You know, she'll occasionally sit in his lap and, you know, uh, kiss him on the neck or something like that and then pop off because she's a bit of a tease. But there's no jokes about body fluids or body parts or anything like that. Uh, okay. Um. So where do, you, where do you go from Robert Asper, man? I mean... You've led us on a nice little trail of of interesting authors. Where do you go from from Robert Asprin? Uh, well, I think 
looking back, my next big one was uh, Robin Hobb. Oh yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? I've never read yeah. it before either. I'm never gonna catch up. I need to retire yeah. and just read. I'll say right now, if you don't have time, do not read Robin Hobb. She is an amazing author, but she writes very slow. Her books take forever to go anywhere. But if you're in the mood for that, there's nobody better. You know, her her stuff is amazing. But if you can't take the time to just kind of expect to plod through a book, you're going to get frustrated. Do you want to do an hour on Robin Hobb? Sure. I'd love to. She's one of my favorite authors. Let's do it. Um, what else do we want to mention about Robert Asprin? The unfortunately um, named Robert Asprin. <laughs> uh, I'll do say. A, do you think it's a, a, a nom de plume? Do you think it's a writer name? Do you think his real name was something else? It doesn't say it here, but like he, that's not even his real name. And he took Robert Asprin because it sounded cool. And I don't know. At the end of the day. I've never thought of that. If he had just taken some aspirin, probably would have been okay. I, I guess my final thoughts on Robert is I'd recommend anybody pick up his first book and try it. Like I said, you can read it in an afternoon, so it's not going to be a huge commitment. If you love it, you love it. Go to the next one. If you don't, well, it's not for everybody. you know. So it's a really easy way to to try an author. It's not a long book. I think the first one was like 170 pages or something like that. And it's oh, okay. small pages. Right at like 45,000 words or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Well, I mean, I'm intrigued with uh, his style, obviously. I mean, oh my God, dude. The The <laughs> caption under this photo says aspirin in 1993. Oh, so the one with his shirt buttoned down? Yeah, so this picture <laughs> was actually taken in the 90s. Oh we, my gosh. Nobody in the 90s was dressing well to begin with, but nobody in the 90s <laughs> dressed like they came from the 70s either. The guy obviously had some problems. Uh, hey, ladies. In the 90s? And you know what? He's rocking like four hairs on his chest. Like you can <laughs> see him. He didn't shave his chest. He just has no hair on his chest, but these four hairs on his chest. Oh my uh, goodness. Robert Asprin's my hero, dude. I mean, <laughs> his name is Robert Lynn Asprin. Lynn. Oh. Right? So I mean, it's probably not an uh, uh, non de plume or a pseudonym or whatever you want to call right? it. It's probably his real name if it's got a middle name in there. Well, I mean, not only that, but a horrible middle name. If you're, gonna, <laughs> if you're gonna give yourself a middle name, make it like Axe Killer or you know, like Bear Slayer or something crazy. Not Lynn. You know what I mean? Lynn's yep. what you get into fights for in elementary school. What's your middle name? Lynn. You know, all the kids <laughs> jump on you. I don't know. <laughs> oh. All right, man. So what do you what do you have coming up that people should be aware of? Uh so if everything goes as planned, this Monday, which will probably be before this launches for your podcast. My podcast launches. Ah, good for you, man. I've finally gotten to that point. Do, so. I need to make sure that I subscribe to it. So um, if I don't like the link when you tweet it, tweet, tweet, send me a direct message so I can get a hold of it and retweet it and actually subscribe and stuff. Yep. I'm going to be sending messages to all the authors that I've worked with, which you uh, cool. are included. You know, So Perfect. that way they can get links to their stories and know when their story is going to come out if it hasn't already. Because I'm going to be dropping, um, I believe, 80 stories on the first day. And then over the course of a month for that, you know, one month uh, thing with um, iTunes and whatever, I'll be putting like three a day for a while and then two a day for a while and then one a day for the last couple of days. Wow. So you're dropping 80. Oh, so how are you going to do this? Because I know a lot of your episodes are small, mm -hmm. six minute things. Are you going to do like an intro for each one or are you just going to uh, jump right into the, to the show itself? No, I'm just uh, basically there's the little couple second intro where it says the name of the channel. Tall Tale um, TV, then, yeah. Yeah, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. And then it goes right into the story. Then it does the little author bio. And then for all of these backlogs, I've just got a couple of different stock, you know, things of me saying, thanks for listening. Check out my email ad or check out my newsletter here. Thanks for listening. Uh, go to this place to do whatever. I've got a couple of those that I'm ending all of them with. But then once I get to where I'm current, I'm going to try to go and start doing longer segments at the end where I'm talking about the piece. Oh, but interesting. I can't okay. do that for 146 episodes. 
it would just take too long. Yeah. Oh man, I'm, I'm excited. It's about time, dude. Are you going to start publishing the stories too on your website? Or are you just going to stick to the, uh, the video format that you have currently going on? What do you mean by publishing the stories? Like in a text? Like, uh, Odin's reward, you take the text of that and put it on your website as it being published. You take the first world serial rights to that, that story and you own it. Um, basically I haven't really thought of that. Uh, mostly I was just an audio thing. I guess I could ask authors if they want me to put the transcription with it. Might actually put you up on another level. I mean, for some reason, I, unfortunately I read, um, an introduction from, uh, the guy who does Clark's world. I think his name is Clark. I'm not actually sure what his name is, but, uh, he was talking about quality and how there's so many people jumping into the, the, to the waters like you and me and everybody trying to get attention, but quality suffers. Right. But, mm -hmm. um, my train of thought just completely evaporated. What, what is it basically <laughs> I was striving for? I mean, it just seems like, like there's a lot of people out there. what is it? <laughs> I said, speaking of quality, I'm just using right? I mean, I never try. So, I mean, it's, this is the same as it is all the time. Just me blabbering <laughs> and the guy or whoever I'm with going, oh my God, what did I get myself in for? I You've have actually done um, better this time than before. So I think you're what, improving. <laughs> oh, it just seems like that. I haven't talked. I don't even know who we're talking about. I'm like, no, I wander around my, my little basement office and then come back to my monitor and look, oh yeah, yeah Robert Asper. <laughs> you wrote some books. Anyway, uh, but yeah, man, I think that'd be cool. You, I mean, if you owned um, the first rights of uh, Odin's Reward, it would just sit on your website. I would get the rights back. I could do whatever I want with the story because basically what I've noticed is a lot of these, I mean, obviously, if you're going to send a story out to like a Clark's World or a Asimov or Science and Fantasy or whatever it is, they want it never to be published anywhere, yeah. right? And that's and why I take secondary rights. Right, exactly. Oh, you take secondary rights. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you've had something published, I'm more than willing to publish it again. Oh, okay. Well, interesting. But you also have taken my first rights, too, on some stuff, right? Or what are they called? First publishing rights. Odin's Reward yeah. and Sebastian's Baby. I think now, because I they've been published by you, they're already published. Well, I've definitely taken the first auditory rights. So I have not published them in the uh, the written form. So yeah. you could still potentially shop around the first. I don't know. Maybe that is considered. I think it like, is, man. Some of, yeah, people, some of these publications are like, don't have it anywhere. Don't have it anywhere. Don't have it published on Reddit. Don't have it published on Twitter. Don't have it published anywhere. Yeah, and that doesn't count for Amazon because a lot of people, you know, uh, publish their book on Amazon uh, exclusive or whatever, where they can't publish it anywhere else. Well, you can if it's audio. So I can still publish those stories. Oh, hell, man. If I get published someplace and they want me to have it read by somebody and they give me the option, I'll definitely send you an email. I've already offered that to you. Sweet. I like your I'm work. I'm actually starting up my uh, um, ACX account here in a couple weeks, hopefully. What's that? Oh, oh ACX is the, uh, the Audible uh, uh, meeting place for um, authors and uh, narrators. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's really cool um, watching this kind of develop. I guess it's been over a year now, huh? Since we've yeah we're close to a year that we've had our first first podcast, and it's been neat seeing how it's kind of progressed for you, and we got another year ahead of us, and it looks like things are just gonna get better. So, here's hoping. Yeah, right. I mean, put forth effort for that to happen only. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. All right, man. Um, awesome conversation as usual. I look forward to the next one. Sounds great. Thank All you. Right, Have a good night. You too.